Matt Carroll, one of our members here, even does some work with them. And so we're glad to have James this morning doing this for us, and we appreciate it. Not going to be every Sunday, but we thank him for being here uh, this morning. So we're talking about thinking outside the pew. And, you know, this, this week I was in the grocery store, and as I walked in, there was an acquaintance of mine who was on an aisle quite a distance away from me. This is an acquaintance that I've known in the nine and a half years I've been here. And he sees me from a distance and he says, hey, Pastor Chris, and he waves to me. And so I march right over to him and I look him in the eye and I say, what are you doing calling me a pastor? Do you not read the Bible? Do you not know what it says about pastors being elders? This one pastor-preacher concept is not even in the Bible. If you'd study, you would know what I'm talking about. Actually, I didn't do that. Do you think how that conversation would have gone had I done something like that? Or let's say I'm at a community event, and I'm sitting at a table with a lot of people I don't know. And one of them strikes up a conversation with me, and he asks me what I do. And so I tell him, he said, oh, minister, well, I go to such and such church. And I say, oh, yeah, that church. Y'all are the ones that still believe in tithing. Don't you know that's an outdated Old Testament concept? How in the world in this day and age can you believe that? Do you not read the Bible? How do you think that conversation would go after that? Or how about this scenario? This happens quite often. We have Someone that watches the television program, if you've ever seen the television program on Sunday mornings, then you know that at the end of it, I encourage people to call us or or let us know if you'd like to set up a Bible study or you'd like to talk with someone. And and this lady calls the church office. She wants to come in. Uh, She's searching. She doesn't have a religious background per se, but she wants answers and she's looking for truth. And so I bring her into my office. She sits down and we open up the Bible to Revelation and we start going through piece by piece how dispensationalism and premillennialism and preterism are all ridiculous, erroneous doctrines. Would I have been right? Yeah, probably. But I was wrong in my approach. You see, here's the thing. So often we slam the door of opportunity because we focus or zero in on the wrong thing. And when a person is outside of Christ... The only thing that matters in the moment is getting them in Christ. That's it. People say, well, you know, you got to set a person straight. You got to let them know. You got to teach the truth. I hear you, but you don't always have to set a person straight. You just don't. And if that's our only goal, then we are failing miserably in making a disciple. Because the only thing that really matters in the moment, if they're outside of Christ, is getting them in Christ. That's all that matters. When I was living in Cassville, Missouri, we had a sweet lady that wanted to study the Bible, and she asked if I would come over, and so Libby and I went to her house, and we got in, and we opened up our Bibles, and she said, so, Revelation, what's that all about? And I explained to her, there are a lot of theologians that still wrestle with Revelation, people that are much more experienced in the Bible than I am, and so I had to redirect the conversation, because that's not what she needed at the moment. I would love to have studied Revelation with her, but what she needed in that moment was the gospel. And so that's what we work toward, is teaching the gospel in the hope that she would become a disciple. Anybody know what this is a picture of? You know what this illustrates? You guessed it. That is getting the cart before the horse. We use this in reference to a situation where we reverse the logical order of things. Here's another one. That one may be a little less uh, obvious, but this is the tail wagging the dog. Same concept, right? When we reverse the logical order of things, it gets to be a problem when presenting the gospel. Because what we want to do so often is we want to zero in on issues or being right or winning an argument when that's not the purpose that we have as Christians. What is our number one responsibility? What is it that we are to be doing above all else? What is the goal? It is this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here is the model. We could sum it up as go, baptize, and teach. That's it. Go baptize and teach. Jesus himself modeled this for us. 
As he took 12 men who left their former lives to follow him, he prayed for them, he took care of them both physically and spiritually, he taught and trained them, and he did all of this for the purpose of sending them out and changing the world. He was making and growing disciples. And Jesus didn't call these men and baptize them and then say, okay, good luck, I hope you make it to heaven. He took care of them. He trained them. He made disciples. And that's what our goal should be as well. How do you do that? Do you do that by converting people to issues? Nope. You do it just as we said, go, baptize, teach. I've said it before, there is no period after verse 19. After verse 19, it says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Many of the things that we get hung up on in the beginning are things that we teach later on. The only thing that matters first and foremost is preaching and teaching the gospel. Laying out that God sent his son to live on this earth, to die, to be crucified, to be buried, to rise again for the forgiveness of your sins. And then the things that follow that are the things that we often want to put at the beginning. It's not that they're unimportant. It's just that they're not the most important thing in the moment. Please understand, I'm not trying to discredit or discount biblical truth in any way, shape, or form. You know me well enough to know that. The issues are important. But we have to be able to discern in the beginning what is the weightier matter. And as I said, if a person is outside of Christ, the only thing that matters in the beginning is getting them in Christ. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night? He was a Pharisee, which explains probably why he came to Jesus at night, so no one would see him. And he comes to Jesus, and we see that he was intrigued by this man that they called Jesus. He confesses that he must be from God. And what does Jesus say to him? Well, then why are you so hung up on these ceremonial cleansings? No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says that you are to be born again of the water and the Spirit. Jesus takes this man's intrigue, his confession, and says, here's what you got to do with that. Because in the moment, that's all that mattered, right? In Acts chapter 17, Paul is at Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and he is there in Athens, and he's preaching this lesson to a bunch of idol worshipers. You couldn't throw a rock without hitting a temple dedicated to an idol in this city. And he gets up there and he begins his speech, his sermon, by saying, how ridiculous you people are. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, I see that you're a religious people. He tries to zero in on what's most important at the moment. He doesn't start by slamming a door. Because once you slam a door, it's very hard, if not impossible, to get it open again. You know, with very little observation, I think one can see that not everyone who is baptized is a committed disciple. I mean, we know that. We understand that there are some who come in, they get baptized, they leave our church building, and they never return. Why is that? Well, I think because so many times we focus in on baptism and converting people to baptism rather than making a disciple. Instead of converting people to baptism... We should be seeking to convert people into being a disciple. I do not believe that Jesus wants converts. I don't. I believe he wants disciples. I mean, he said to go and make disciples. And the term disciple was used by Jesus to describe a follower more than any other word that was used. And yet all too often, our efforts produce a convert, but not a disciple. And what's the difference, you ask? Well, let's look at this from a... From a baby standpoint, we all love babies, right? At least from a distance. We love babies. They're sweet, they're cute, they're innocent. Who doesn't love babies? And when babies are infants, they are completely selfish and self centered. You have to take care of their every need, but that's okay because we understand, right? They're babies. That's just how it works. You know what's not cute and sweet and innocent? When they're the same way when they're 35. That's not cute anymore. In fact, we would yell at them and say, why don't you get out and get a job, you lazy bum. Go get on with your life. What are you doing still living at home? All those kind of things, right? It's not cute. It's not sweet. It's not innocent. When someone is self-centered 
and selfish and immature later on in life because as parents, we understand there is a natural growth and development there, right? There is maturation that has to occur. And while it's hard to let them go, it's somewhat exciting as well because we know they can't stay with us forever. And so we look forward to them being independent and being able to live on their own and start their own life. And the same is true when it comes to discipleship. Conversion is good. I mean, converting someone, baptizing someone is obviously a good thing. It's the most important decision a person will ever make in their lives, but they can't stay a convert forever. They have to move on to discipleship. At some point, they have to grow and mature and develop. Here's the difference, the biggest difference between converts and disciples. Converts are all about believing. Disciples are all about being. Converts hear and believe the Word of God, but disciples live it. Converts may be involved in the mission of Jesus, but disciples are committed to it. Converts tend to cheer from the sidelines, but disciples are in the game. Converts often want to go to heaven, but don't necessarily want to go to church. Converts are comfortable. Disciples make sacrifices. Converts follow the rules where disciples follow Jesus. Converts, if they go to church, they go to a building while disciples are the church. Converts want God to be first in their lives, but usually he comes second on their calendars. It's the difference in someone making a statement through baptism and someone seeking to live out their baptism. Now, don't get me wrong. As I said, there's nothing wrong with a convert as long as that person who has converted understands that there's more to follow. We often treat baptism like it's the finish line, and it's not. It's the start line. It's the beginning. If you've ever run a race, you've done so with the knowledge of knowing something about the course that you're going to run. If you've ever run a race, you've probably built up your endurance by running shorter distances or maybe running distances that are similar to the race that you're going to run. Maybe you've employed the efforts of a coach. You've probably looked at what the weather's going to be like the day of the race. You've done some research. And as Christian runners can attest to, those of you who are Christian runners here this morning, you know that it takes effort, it takes endurance, it takes diligence to run the Christian race. But when we simply baptize someone and send them on their way, all we're doing is blindfolding them, putting them at the start line and saying, good luck, hope you make it to the finish line. They need someone to help train them, to teach them. That's what Jesus is talking about. Baptism isn't the finish line. It's not the goal. It's just the beginning. In fact, do you know what the term disciple literally means? It means learner. A disciple is a learner. It denotes one who follows another's teaching. A disciple is also an adherent. In ancient times, a disciple was referred to as an imitator of his teacher. That was the goal of a disciple, to be like his teacher. And do you remember what is said in Luke 6 and 40? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. That should be our goal, to be like our teacher. And it should be our goal to help others be like their teacher, not like us, but like Jesus, to follow in his footsteps, to imitate him. This goal coincides with God's goal in the redemption of mankind. Paul's words in 829 reveal this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So the beginning of discipleship is baptism. The beginning, not the end. It's not the goal. We're not trying to convert people to baptism. We're trying to make disciples. We've got to be careful. Because I think what happens too often in the church is that we want to sit down with someone and we want to rush them through the steps of salvation so that we can get them in the baptistry because after all this is urgent. We've got to hurry this process. And so what we do is something that is very unbiblical, but we've done it for years, is we hunt and peck through the Bible. We pluck out the verses that pertain to baptism and we show them to the person. And we're not trying to do it. It's not something that we intend to do. But what we do is we convert someone to baptism rather than showing them the whole picture. 
There are some real problems with hunting and pecking our way through Scripture. I mean, for one, this method creates poor Bible students, doesn't it? The Bible is not a reference book. The Bible is one continuous story about the redemption of mankind. And when we hunt and peck our way through it, we're teaching people indirectly that the other stuff just isn't that important. Don't worry about all the other stuff surrounding this. Here's the most important verses, right? Here's what you really need to know. Secondly, this method sends the message that there are some things in the Bible that you really don't have to pay attention to. And again, I know we don't try to do that, but indirectly, we end up doing that. We jump from verse to verse and communicate that we're only sharing the really important stuff. People need to know all the details surrounding baptism, not just that they need to do it. This method also leads to baptizing people but not making disciples. We've got to stop proof texting people into baptism. We need to quit rushing people through the steps of salvation and we need to focus on what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is not just someone who has been baptized. A disciple is defined in the New Testament as someone who puts Jesus first Before family, before themselves, before everything. Jesus comes before anything in one's life. A disciple is also someone who follows Jesus' teachings. He even said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love Jesus, if we want to be a true disciple, we follow the teachings of Christ. We are doers of the word, as James put it. We follow the example. We also forsake everything to follow Jesus. A true disciple has counted the cost. They consider the sacrifice and they make the sacrifice. They deem it as worth it because of what they gain in the end. And finally, a disciple makes disciples. You have been saved to save. That is your primary responsibility as a disciple, to make disciples. The gospel is meant to be received and then shared. We're talking about contagious Christianity here. It's pretty hard for an individual to learn what it means to be a disciple if we're only hitting the high spots. We've got to present this holistically. Showing them the one continuous story. Helping them understand the gospel and what it means to a sinner. In the moment, that's the most important thing. And you know what? They, that may take a while. Someone may not necessarily buy in in the beginning. And even if they do, we don't stop there. and we don't, we don't breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, good, we'll let God take it from there. No, we have a responsibility to continue. Again, there's not a period after verse 19. It is our responsibility to teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Understand that they have a responsibility as well. A convert, a new disciple, a new Christian cannot come into church services every Sunday or Wednesday and expect everyone to spoon feed them for the rest of their lives. At some point, as we always say, you've got to take off the bib and put on an apron. But everyone needs training. Everyone needs help along the way to mature and grow as they should. I like what Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard had to say about this subject. He said, I went into church and I sat on the velvet pew. I watched as the sun came shining through the stained glass windows. The minister, dressed in a velvet robe, opened the golden gilded Bible, marked it with a silk bookmark, and he said, If any man will be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, sell what he has, give it to the poor, and follow me. And I looked around. And nobody was laughing. This is serious stuff. Too serious to lose an opportunity or to forfeit an opportunity by slamming a door, focusing on something that's not necessary in the moment, or only converting people to baptism and not teaching them to observe all that he has commanded. Christians are to make disciples which includes baptizing them and teaching them. We could state it this way. The disciples' movement is to go. The disciples' plea is to make disciples. And the disciples' plan is baptizing and teaching. 
This is reproductive discipleship. This is what it means to be a disciple, that we are to make and grow disciples. It's our mission here at Oldham Lane. We are to make and grow disciples. You've seen that logo over and over again. Because this is what we are about. At least it's what we want to be about. To make and grow disciples. Have you ever been to a church where they have a wooden board at the front like this? You know, a lot of times this will show the attendance. It'll show sometimes the song numbers. Sometimes it shows the offering. And there are a lot of them that have baptisms for the year. You've seen these? And that's great. I mean, I think it's great that we keep up with baptisms. We do so in our bulletin. But what if we looked at more than just a number there? I think it's great if a church can boast that they've had 30 or 40 baptisms in a year. That's fantastic, right? And we should be proud of that. But we hear about baptisms as if they're a quota. You know, we baptize so many in the prison, or we baptize so many in the mission field, and yet retention rate is not real good a lot of times. What if we could look at that number and see something more than just a number? What if we could put next to the number in our bulletin, Baptisms, disciples made. That's a little harder to decipher, though, isn't it? That takes a little more time. But that's the goal. The goal is not a definite number. The goal is what comes after baptism. And making and growing a convert into a disciple. Let me close with this. Allow me to ask you a question. This may be for some of our older members, okay? Here's the question. Who starred in such TV shows as, and movies, in Search for Tomorrow, The Last Time I Saw Archie, Move Over Darling, and The Prize Fighter? Any guesses? Okay, here's a hint. Nip it in the bud. Bullet in shirt pocket. Sheriff's deputy, ringing any bell? That guy. We talked about him last week, didn't we? Don Knotts will forever be known as the bumbling deputy to Andy Taylor in the Andy Griffith Show, right? He cannot get away from that role. No matter what other movie he was in or television show he was in, He'll always be known as Barney Fife. In Hollywood, they call that typecasting. And in Christianity, they call it discipleship. Wouldn't it be great if people looked at us and all they saw was Jesus? We couldn't get away from it. They looked at us and they saw someone who imitated Jesus in every way, who was a, a true disciple in that they looked like the Master. They were so typecast that you, you couldn't see them as anything else. What if that described us? What if we made that the goal, not only for ourselves, but for other people? Seeking to save the lost. Seeking to make disciples. Wouldn't it be great to be known as nothing else than simply a Christ follower. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity that we've had to worship you. We thank you so much for this church family. We thank you that we have a mission. And we pray that we live out that mission every day. We thank you that we have a Savior. And may we seek to save those who need you. May we make that our goal to make a disciple. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. You know, I want to say this during the invitation. If you would, please keep from rifling through the pew and putting stuff up. You know, I got a call yesterday afternoon that my father had had another heart attack. And so I, I called, and uh, his, his girlfriend that he has been with for 20-something years, she is the one that called me. And so we talked, and... And my dad had to have a stent put in. He's going to need open heart surgery at some point, uh, maybe this week. He's, 
He's had a massive heart attack before in which he should have died. And, you know, I've, I've talked to you folks many times about my family and how they're not Christians. And, you know, I, as part of the invitation, I'd like to ask you to pray for me and for my family. I got to talk to my dad last night, and he was much better. They put a stent in. He was feeling better. And he said, you might want to take the phone off speaker. I had it on speaker so the kids could hear. And he did the whole thing about, you know, I, I think I've got everything in order. If something which would, would happen, you know, uh, everything's okay. And I said, well, you know, Dad, I'm not worried about that. But you know what I am worried about. And he said, I know. And he said, my sister was just here, and she talked to me about it, and I need to do that. So pretty exciting stuff. So hopefully that happens very soon. But keep us in your prayers. Um, we've got so many in our congregation that are hurting, that are struggling physically, but we've got a lot of folks that come in here every Sunday dressed up and decked out, and underneath, they're dying inside, spiritually. Let's reach out to them as well, and let us help you. Don't wear a mask, let us help you. If you have a need this morning that we can help you with, if you're ready to stand at the start line and put on Christ in baptism, let's do that. And if you need to get back on the course, do that this morning. And if you just need prayers for endurance, let us help you. Clinton is going to lead us a song. Come as we stand and as we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light.